Hello, everyone. Thank you for your patience. In our next panel, we will learn about the vital role of coastal ecosystems that they play in protecting our coastal cities and mitigating climate change. I would like to introduce the moderator for our coastal ecosystems panel, Dr. Cindy Wang. Cindy graduated from MIT with a PhD in civil and environmental engineering in 2019, followed by a postdoc in mechanical engineering before joining Exponent as an environmental consultant in 2020. Her studies and work focus on assessing the impact of human activity on the marine and freshwater environments, such as oil spills, deep sea mining, and shipping. Cindy is a 2021 Climate Ambassador at the Global Youth Climate Network of the World Bank. I'm gonna hand it over to Cindy now. Thank you. Thank you, Autumn. Can everybody hear me okay? Good afternoon and welcome to the first panel of the 2021 Water Summit. This panel focuses on coastal ecosystems because coastal resources and the services that they offer brings tremendous benefits to sustainable development of the coastal regions and beyond. Specifically, we will explore the challenges and opportunities for our research and businesses uh, as we look to preserve the, our coastal resources and also to discover new ecological services. Um, so on the panel today, we are honored to have three incredible experts on the subject. So we have Dr. Anne Michelle Morrison, uh, Dr. Heidi Neff, and last but not least, Dr. Loretta Robertson. <laughs> Thank you all for joining us today. Um, so we'll get started by allowing the panelists to introduce themselves, and then we'll move on to a 30 to 40 minutes of panel Q&A, and finally we'll wrap it up with five to 15 minutes of questions from the audience. Um, so first up for the self-introduction, uh, we have Heidi. Okay, great, can you hear me? I feel like I didn't get the memo about the black shirt. But. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Cindy asked that I, I say a little bit about where I'm from. Uh, I have my undergraduate degree from Bucknell University in Mechanical Engineering, and then I got a PhD in Stanford in Civil Engineering, uh, and I started at MIT in 93, and I've been here more than half my life, which is pretty scary to say that out loud. Uh, my lab studies how vegetation interacts, uh, how flow and waves interact with vegetation with the goal of coming up with physical models to help describe um, some of the things behind the nature-based solutions that Paul Kirshen was talking about earlier. Uh, I, some of our recent, recent projects involve uh, models to predict wave damping by marsh vegetation. So you can see our marsh model over there, seagrasses. Our tagline is sometimes we recreate nature in the lab and sometimes we go out to meet her in person. Uh, and then at a much larger scale, we also look at how sediment is transported through marshes to understand how that sediment is retained. It has to do uh, looking at issues of vegetation density and vegetation distribution, um, how sediment is supplied and what are the physical processes that let it be captured within the marsh. That's very important for restoration. If the marshes can't capture sediment, they can't build themselves. And also, um, it's important for uh, carbon sequestration. Uh, the marshes actually capture a lot of carbon that's coming in as floating organic matter. Uh, and that process is a physical process that we study, is that filtering and capturing of sediment. I didn't have you guys sit in order, I'm realizing, so I'm going to jump ahead to Loretta's slides and then go back to um, Anne Michelle so that we keep in the order going across. So Loretta, you can take it away. <laughs> Perfect. Thanks so much. So I'm a researcher at the Marine Biological Laboratory down in Woods Hole, and my research focuses on both corals and how they respond to anthropogenic stresses as well as seaweeds and how we can grow them at a scale large enough that they may become a climate solution. Um, I, I guess I'll go a little bit about my background. Um, I got my undergraduate degree at Cal State Northridge in biology and a PhD at Stanford University mm -hmm. in biological sciences. And I was a professor at the University of Puerto Rico in the Department of Environmental Sciences for a number of years. and. Um, and then have been at the MBL now for the past five. 
But what brought me or drew me to seaweeds in the first place was the you know, number of potential benefits that they can provide. And so I have a list of them here. So you know, we can talk about carbon sequestration, as, as Heidi mentioned. They are able to remove excess nutrients from the water, help restore ecosystems through um, providing um, nursery habitat or just habitat. Um, they can be used to enrich soils through amendments. Um, we can address the plastics problem by actually making plastics from seaweeds. We can reduce the amount of um, methane that are produced by livestock by feeding them some types of seaweeds and produce a number of uh, both food and uh, novel products like textiles. And then one of the most important things too is just creating jobs and improving livelihoods of people in coastal areas. But in each of these, there's still a lot of uncertainty or unknowns, especially when we talk about going to a scale large enough where we may be able to um, combat climate change. And so, for example, in carbon se sequestration, they, we know they fix carbon, they grow quickly, but at a large scale, they also are um, releasing mucus, dissolved organic matter to the environment. They're senescing. Where does that carbon go? Can we keep track of it? And then for, for jobs, we may design a system that you know, works well and is cost effective here in New England, but is it the same type of system that can be deployed in Florida or someplace like Belize? And so um, with the work I'm doing, we're trying to address not all of these, but at least think about it holistically and in order to really develop the seaweed industry here in the US. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm really honored to be here sitting on this panel. It's really interesting to hear about the work you guys are doing because I sit at the uh, intersection of where science and industry kind of meet. And so I take a lot of the stuff that you guys are doing and apply it and help clients. So just to quickly go through my background, um, I, uh, for the last 25 years, I've been studying the impacts of human activity on natural resources and human health. Um, I'm by training an aquatic ecotoxicologist. The icons on the screen represent the uh, institutions, organizations where I received my academic and uh, early professional training. Um, of note to this group is the years that I spent as a benthic ecologist at the Bermuda Biological Station for Research, which is now known as the Bermuda Institute of Ocean Sciences, where um, I worked with the team that studied the impacts of uh, human activity on the reefs and seagrasses in, in and around Bermuda. I received my Doctor of Science degree from the Harvard School of Public Health, and I performed my dissertation research at, um, in John Stegman's lab in the biology department at, at Huey. Um, I've also included the Massachusetts Water Resources Authority on here because I was a broke graduate student and I needed money. So I took a, uh, an internship at MWRA as a biostatistician. And I was helping them to analyze daily bact beach bacteria water quality data um, to try to develop a more predictive model for when the beaches would be safe or unsafe for swimming. And that kind of changed the course of my career because while I love bench science and I love field work, um, solving real world problems in real time uh, was kind of a bug that, that caught me. And so if you go to the next slide. Um, today, I'm a principal scientist at Exponent um, in the ecological and biological sciences practice. Exponent is an international engineering and scientific consulting firm. Cindy's one of my colleagues. And um, we have over 90 technical disciplines under one virtual house, and more than 60% of our staff have PhD or doctoral degrees. So I've read a, written out some questions here. I'm not going to read them to you. But the work that I do in ecosciences is um, usually I work for corporate clients, though I've also worked for government entities as well as um, a private citizen who was concerned about a coastal development going in next to her property. Um, these questions kind of center around the themes of the work that I do. In general, clients come to me when there's been an allegation of ecological harm or ecological change related to their business operations. So I'm retained to help them look to see if there's actually been a change and whether the change is adverse and if there's been an adverse change to quantify the injury associated with that change and identify restoration options um, that could compensate for those injuries. And so that's often part of a natural resource damage assessment, which is a legal framework for assessing uh, injury and damages. 
against responsible parties. Another aspect of my work is looking at net environmental benefits from both restoration and mitigation uh, actions, as well as prospectively looking at development options and looking at what the ecological consequences and benefits would be for an action. So um, I'm really looking forward to our conversation today. And thank you for having me. Thank you all for your introductions. Um, so the first question is for Heidi. Mm -hmm. um, so Heidi, you, you began talking about the role of um, green infrastructure so, uh, in the uh, climate mitigation adaptation role. Um, could you comment more on how tidal marshes, um, mangrove trees, and uh, seagrass meadows make our coastline more resilient in terms of the physics? Because I know Paul earlier on went extensively into yeah. the design of um, so, uh, the so I guess what solution. I, I think I'll piggyback on what Paul talked about. Mm -hmm. um, the reason why marshes and all what, we, what I call green infrastructure, some people call it soft in infrastructure, um, is getting a lot of attention is Historically, we've used hard infrastructure or gray infrastructure, which tends to, as Paul described, um, it doesn't dissipate storm energy so much as reflect it. So if I put up green infrastructure at one location to protect one location, chances are another location is getting the reflected or getting high energy. Um, and a really great example of this um, people like to hold up is the Netherlands, which are very famous for their barrier infrastructure that they've built. I believe it's one of the modern wonders of the engineering world that's on that list. Uh, and they have all, a series of barriers and dikes that are protecting the country, the low-lying country, from flooding. But what they realized was that um, in having the, the dikes and the wall systems um, protecting the co more coastal zones, it was actually accelerating the penetration of floodwaters inland. So they're making flooding inland worse by protecting the shore. Uh, and so uh, in the 90s, they changed their tactic and they started to move dikes back away from the coast and fill in that space with marshes because um, green infrastructure is porous, so it can absorb the flows, it can absorb the, and dissipate the wave energy unlike the green structure. So that's why the green infrastructure is very important. Um, but not only, so that's probably a coastal defense reason why we would care about green infrastructure. Uh, it also, as Paul alluded to, it, it potentially grows along with sea level rise so that it's actually sort of self-maintaining. It provides habitat. Uh, it can also, um, as Loretta mentioned, um, cycle nutrients, so it can help uh, mitigate uh, uh, nutrient pollution that is coming from runoff or from non-point sources along the coast. So in additional provided coastal protection, these natural ecosystems have, have many other benefits that uh, make them valuable. Thank you, Heidi. Um, so just going back to the seaweed again, Loretta, uh, so you began to talk about in your slides the key benefits of uh, seaweeds, and there are quite a number of them. And so we'll uh, get into uh, carbon sequestration a bit, but for now, um, can you comment more on how exactly uh, seaweed farming can support the livelihood of uh, coastal communities and create jobs? Yeah, sure, thanks. Um, so there are a lot of benefits to aquaculture in general, not just seaweeds. Um, we've learned a lot about how to culture things like fish that have had a bad rap in the past for polluting the environment by moving them offshore. Um, but <clears throat> when we were talking about going up to a scale, and I guess or maybe I'll, I'll start with just at a, a regular scale of what we see now in the US developing. Um, in the past couple of years, we've seen um, see the seaweed industry um, grow 20 times, which is exciting. Um, we've produced about 500 tons of seaweed this year, um, but that's pretty small compared to um, what you see globally at 32 million tons produced, mm -hmm. mostly in Asia. Um, but that said, I think um, they, they provide jobs for people um, working the farms, but then also on land processing that, that seaweed, and then for people that, that sell it either for food or use it as fertilizer, et cetera. So there's, 
there's multiple levels of jobs just at, for the small scale farmer. And then when you go to the larger scales, when all those other key benefits come in. And you know, I, ideally you could envision deploying a seaweed system in an area where there's getting excess nutrient pollution coming in. Um, and, and so then you're creating you know, another layer of, of jobs in the blue sector. Right. Um, OK, so this, I guess, leads to my next question to you, which is, um, so I was going to comment that seaweed farming is a six billion industry globally. Um, and you mentioned it right now, it's growing, but doesn't yet have a, a big presence in the US. Um, so uh, what do you think are the obstacles to upscaling seaweed farming in the US? And um, how should we address that in your opinion? Okay, yeah, I, um, I should mention, or I should have mentioned too, that most of the seaweed farming that's done currently is really taking place in just Alaska and um, Maine. <laughs> um, and I think a common theme that we've heard with the speakers today is permitting, permitting, permitting. And even for our pilot research systems, we've had to wait one or two years to get the permit. Um, uh, on the other side, another obstacle, at least for development here in the US, is the processing side. So we, we need to be able to produce a bunch of seaweed so that a processor will say, oh, it's worth it for me to, um, to switch my operation, say, from processing other seafood to processing seaweed, or building the structure, infrastructure to do it. But then the grower can't grow seaweed if there's no, no processor there for it. So, I think those two things are, are really um, uh, big obstacles. But then there's also the research. As I mentioned, we, we understand that seaweeds can do a lot of things and like to think of it as maybe a magic bullet, but there's still so much that we don't know for sure exactly you know, how they do it and can we do it for a long period of time. When we get to scale, do we have to, or you know, we do have to worry about diseases and how do we control them um, in a sustainable way. Thank you, Loretta. Um, so we know that coastal ecosystems benefits um, uh, a lot the environmental health and also it supports the livelihood of the coast communities. Um, but coastal ecosystems uh, also is becoming increasingly important to the companies and businesses worldwide. Um, so Anne Michelle, can you walk us through how businesses can benefit uh, from ecological services? Yeah, sure. Um, so it's interesting. Uh, I, I can't remember if it was Heidi or or if Loretta was talking about like the energy of a seagrass blade. Was that your work? That's that's <laughs> Heidi's work. Because actually, one of the companies that I was speaking to a few years ago, they had actually had undertaken their own research and looking at the energy that is mitigated by a single blade of grass. Because they were looking to understand like how they could use green infrastructure and, and blue carbon systems to help mitigate wave energy. And it's in the um, oil and gas industry. They're doing kind of that basic level research. And so as far as coastal ecosystems go, most businesses have a coastal presence. It's a lot of businesses do at some stage, whether it's from the shipping side or from the importing side. And a lot of, um, a lot of the infrastructure, especially like the oil and gas infrastructure, is built along the Gulf of Mexico or you know, in, in wetland areas. And so understanding the um, Climate change is really making everybody think a lot more about coastal ecosystems, right? Because sea level storms are getting more fierce, sea level is rising, and a lot more damage. I mean, if we look at the state of Texas and everything that's happened in Texas uh, with hurricanes that have come through and flooding, um, businesses are noting this because their insurance rates are going up and they're looking for opportunities to uh, reduce their risk and ecosystems and, and, and ecosystem services that are provided by them, such as you know, the provisioning services of just clean water for business operations or the regulating services 
or the supporting services uh, that you know, the Millennium Assessment has gone into in characterizing, because that uh, wave energy mitigation, the flood risk um, minimization, the pollution sequestration that you guys were talking about, you know, all that kind of stuff is important to business clients because they are operating oftentimes um, and they have permits for waste that they release. And if those healthy ecosystems aren't in place and if they aren't supporting those healthy ecosystems, then even their permitted waste isn't being a, a, um, mitigated in the environment the way it should. So it's it's kind of, nature is amazing, and coastal ecosystems, I think, are some of the most amazing um, habitat features around because they are a way for us to, as humans, to um, live in harmony with our, our natural world. But I think the, uh, the new emphasis on supporting these ecosystems and um, and helping to build them up is, is going to be even more and more important. And, and you see that in corporate sustainability reports. I don't know if anybody's looked at corporates. Like, there's a lot of interesting stuff that businesses are saying they're doing um, in trying to build up uh, ecosystems around the world. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you, I'm Michelle. Um, so going back to Heidi, uh, I wanted to explore uh, more on the challenges of perhaps implementing nature-based solutions uh, right now. Um, uh, so um, in your opinion, are there any obstacles to that process? Or is it simply a matter of time? Because I know um, nature-based solution is gaining a lot of traction uh, nowadays. So I think that um, there's a, there are obstacles to nature-based solutions. Uh, certainly, Paul alluded to them, the whole permitting thing. But what's buried also in there is the idea that there's limited land availability at the coast, and that a lot of the land at the coast is privately owned. Mm -hmm. So even though uh, all these ecosystem services that we think are very important is a public good, um, you're going to have to negotiate a lot of times with private land in order to implement these things. Uh, then if what, what, uh, if you take what Paul Kirshen described further, I'm sorry, for those of you who weren't there, he was talking about situations where they would basically take a shoreline that is now an urban shoreline and in front of it build a marsh. Well, so now a lot of people are losing their shorefront and a lot of people don't like that. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a lot of um, need to do a lot of uh, community-based outreach to build community support for these solutions and get everyone on the same page before any policy will be able to go through. So I think that's one thing. I think the second one, um, which I think Anna Michelle alluded to, is, is um, in business that you have to be able to value, and Paul mentioned this too, um, how do you value these resources? So for example, um, if you look at wave dissipation, and I want to say um, I'm a company and I'm going to protect this much marsh, and it's going to give me this benefit of wave dissipation. But those models don't really exist. That's why my lab is working on that. How do you know that um, 200 meters of Spartina is going to damp the waves 80%? And how do you know that consistently? And how does it vary when the seasonality of the vegetation growth? So we don't have good. We need better models to be able to make that transfer function between here's the physics of what's happening, and here's how much money it's worth to this community. Uh, and then I think the last thing, and that, I mean, that also extends to the blue carbon markets, is this idea that if I want to um, sell an acre of marsh on a blue carbon market, blue carbon meaning carbon market for ocean systems, in case you're not familiar with that term, uh, you know, how do I verify that this much marsh is worth this much carbon? And how do I verify how long it will retain that much carbon? Um, there's a lot of heterogeneity in the environment. So it's really not enough to just say, ooh, I have 500 acres of marsh, and I'm going to go to the middle and make a core and say that's how much carbon I have. There's so much. We have to understand that heterogeneity. A lot of it's linked to physical processes because, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of the carbon that's captured in these coastal systems is called alloctonous carbon, which is brought in from outside. So it's not the biomass itself. In terrestrial systems, it's often only the, the plant's biomass is what's being sequestered. But in aquatic systems, you can be capturing a lot of the carbon is coming in from outside. And how do we account for that? And how do we measure that? So I think those are the main barriers that I see. Let's continue on that topic of blue carbon. 
Um, so I know it's a big overlapping all of your experiences. Um, so uh, perhaps the other two panelists can comment on what do you think is the challenges in quantifying blue carbon? Um, and what are the factors that should be considered in those models so that they can be built more reliably to actually inform, for example, business decisions and, um, and so on? I'll let you go first. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> well, if in terms of, say, seaweed systems, if we want to use it for blue carbon, um, it's like Heidi mentioned, there's there's also heterogeneity on a farm, and we're just now studying that and understanding what that is. And, but we don't know how that works when we get at larger and larger scales where it, it could make a, a significant contribution to carbon sequestration. And so I think um, understanding that and, and working, we work with engineers too, and um, I would love to talk some more later about you know, spacing of farms and how we can optimize that. Um, to either, you know, increase productivity and so sequester more carbon um, or remove more nutrients. But in, in addition to that, there's just the basic biology. We still don't know how much, you know, the seasonality um, changes in terms of how much they're sequestering, how much they're growing. Um, even in tropical areas where you have sunshine and warm temperatures year-round, we still do see seasonality there in their growth. Um, you can have for farming systems situations where other organisms will settle on your seaweed farm and impact the growth of those. And that's um, maybe happening more and more as the water's warming. Um, and, and, but it's also stochastic. We can't yet predict when that's going to happen year to year easily. So I, there is still a lot of, of work to be done, at least for the seaweed sector. And what's interesting is I'm seeing exactly what you guys are talking about, it, but coming at it from a really different angle. So um, I don't know if you guys are aware of the, Discup of the Discupta review that came out in the UK um, back in February, I think is when it was. So this was a report um, commissioned by the UK Ministry of Finance. And they wanted to understand um, biodiversity and the role of nature in, in financial planning. And the goal really is to be able to monetize using ecosystem services the value of nature so that um, it can actually be hardwired into financial decisions, into business, into investing opportunities. And so I found this really fascinating and really interesting. And given that um, we use ecosystem services in my work, sorry, when we do natural resource damage assessments, you know, when there's been an injury, we quantify the injury in terms of ecosystem services. We find a restoration project that would provide um, an equivalent amount of services that have been lost. And so I'm quite familiar with the world of ecosystem services. But I also know that they can be a little squishy. Um, because when we are in, an, you know, in, in a litigation situation uh, where there's a responsible party and a government entity and trying to resolve um, the ecosystem services lost, usually the responsible party scientists come to the table and the government scientists has come to the table, and we all we both present our analysis based on the science, and then the lawyers take it away, and then they negotiate something in the back room. And so science is present in that, but it's not hard and fast. It's not an absolute, because there's a lot of uncertainty, and different scientists can look at the same set of data and come at different conclusions, which you guys are probably all familiar with. And so when I was listening to the Desgupta review and these economists saying, Ecosystem services are the way it's going to be the answer, you know. We can, we can know how much carbon is sequestered by these seagrass beds, and that can be equated to a dollar value, and then we can plug it into financial models. And I was like, oh, I don't think that's going to work so well. <laughs> and so I went back to my colleagues, um, one of my colleagues, Andrew Dynas at Exponent, and um, my former colleague, Roxolana Kashuba, who's now at EPA. And we just presented, a, uh, or it will be released, I think, this week at the SeaTac conference. We looked at ecosystem yeah, ecological production functions. So EPA maintains a library of EPFs, and that is taking a measurable quantity and taking it through a mathematical equation to produce an ecosystem service. And so we thought, okay. 
let's just choose one ecosystem service, like denitrification of a marsh or something like that. And there's a library, and there's dozens and dozens of articles in this library of scientists who've gone out and, and quantified denitrification and equated the ecosystem service. And what we find, and tune into SeaTac, I don't know when it's being released, Everybody uses a different unit. They average over a different time scale. They're, you can't compare any of it. And so when I'm thinking about these financial uh, business, you know, the financial world that wants to take our world of eco sciences and translate it to dollars, this uncertainty that we're all aware of, and even something you know that seemed like it was, should be so simple to go to the EPA library and pull out one function. Everybody named it something different. So I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done, just like. On the, on the ground level science, but also in like translating that science, because it feels like the world is watching us as ecological scientists, as in coastal scientists right now, to produce an answer that can be factored into the financial markets. And as you guys were talking about, I mean, just from the research you're seeing, the uncertainty is huge. And how do you translate that into financial risk uncertainty at the, at the business and financial level? Well, and then to add to that is the uncertainty that um, as climate changes, and storms get more intense, coastal systems will keep being damaged. Right. And so are they going to ensure the carbon credit you get against the or whatever ecosystem service you're getting credit yeah. for, are you going to have to insure it against nature's damage in itself, basically? There's some it's really very complicated but fascinating. So you should all go into it. <laughs> it is. Go into this field. There's a lot that needs to be done. We need you. <laughs> no, there's really interesting. Have you seen the insurance policies that are being made on nature? So oh, in Mexico, okay. there's now an insurance policy on the reef off of oh I can't remember which town oh, it is. Really? On the yeah. deep blue hole? No, I don't I remember which one it is, but the Nature yeah. Conservancy yeah. ran it and um, and Swiss Re is the insurer, and it's they're proposing right. it as a model for yeah. it, how to get um, get businesses and governments to buy into protecting coastal infrastructure by by providing an insurance policy that basically, and it's a, I can't remember the name of it, it's a trigger policy so that when a wind, when the wind hits a certain speed, it triggers the payout of the policy, which would then go in and restore the reef um, because the reef is essential to the businesses. And so there's, there's ideas about developing these insurance pro, um, policies for natural resources. Yeah, so it, I mean, I think the insurance field, which, I mean, I grew up thinking insurance field is so boring, <laughs> but it's, I think, gonna be at the forefront of driving solutions because exactly. their job is to say, because we're trying to say, let's value nature. That's been their job all along. How do I value anything? Exactly. So I tell you how much you have to pay me to insure it. So I feel like bringing them in there, I mean, they're getting in the mix, as you say. They but are. I attended so um, statistics, <laughs> go into insurance, and that would be you know, your way of saving the environment. <laughs> No, I turned, attended the Ocean Risk Summit that was held in Bermuda in 2018, and um, it was, you know, illuminaries from all over the world, and NOAA was there, and lots of not-for-profits, and it was the insurance companies and the banks, and Moody's was there, yeah. and they got up there and they said, I, it opened my eyes because they were like, climate change is not going to be, we, like, our world is not going to be protected from climate change by governments. It's just not going to happen. It's going to be the insurance companies and the banks that are going to do it. And they gave the example that, um, you know, a couple hundred years ago or even longer, ships were burning up and buildings were burning down because there were, and people were losing their livelihoods because, you know, fire was such a huge risk. And so business owners and homeowners would come to the insurance companies and say, can you insure my business? because I can't lose my shirt on this. And they said, sure, we'll insure it, but you've got to install sprinklers. You've got to install drywall. You've got to do all this. And they said that the banks, this conference, they're, what I took away from it was the banks and the insurance companies are going to say, if you want a loan for your business operations, you need to prove to me that you're doing X, Y, and Z, that you're mitigating this risk. Same thing for insurance and you know money. And so you're right. Like That's they're gonna be the ones who drive it. And but they're gonna. I, I developed this infographic that shows like <laughs> these these the insurers and the banks are kind of sitting at the top, and they're gonna put pressure on the governments because municipal governments, state governments, like. Um, international governments, everybody needs money. They need risk ratings from Moody's. They need to be able to borrow money and get insurance. And so the governments, I think, are going to have to show that they're 
becoming resilient and prepared for climate change by instituting laws and, and hmm. standards. But the industries are also going to get the same pressure, but they're going to get it from both sides. So the, they're going to have the banks and the insurers pressing them, as well as the governments creating regulations and things like that. So it's really an interesting, um, an interesting triumvirate, a little, <laughs> little triangle of pressure that's coming along. But there, there does become a dangerous um, issue is that um, when, when you focus too much on business and the insurance is then, then the social equity comes out. Yes. Because, you know, poor person can't afford to buy insurance to protect their, and yet we just said, isn't that a public good to have clean water and a safe coastline? So it's very complicated, but I'm sorry, Loretta. No, I, I was just going to say that in addition to statisticians, we need the science, though, to help better understand yes, exactly. how these ecosystems science. can provide the services they do and how they'll perform under storms. Exactly, because like, that's what I took away from like these meetings of these banks and like they think we as ecologists have got all the answers and it's just like, wow. <laughs> <laughs> but there's a lot we still need to figure out. So there's actually a lot of interesting questions trickling from the audience. Oh, so I'm just gonna trickling. go ahead and take one because I think it's very relevant to what we're talking about here. So the question is, do you think a financial quantification of the benefits generated by ecosystem services is necessary for mass implementation of coastal restoration and resilience projects? I can take a stab at that. From the, from the ecosystem services world, uh, there's, a, there's different camps in the world, and there's those camps that really don't like putting dollars to ecosystems because ecosystems have fundamental value. Um, but then there's an, there are other camps that say we have to put a dollar value because if we want to get everybody's attention, dollars or money is the universal language of, of our society. So do you have to? Is that what the question is? Like, my opinion is you don't have to, but I think that, um, and I understand why you shouldn't, why people think you shouldn't, but I think, I think it will happen, how accurate and how fair and robust it is, but I'll let you guys weigh in. Well, I mean, I, mean, I think you have to do it because right now, many people are taking advantage. I mean, historically, people have took, taken advantage of the environment to profit for themselves. And because they didn't have to take into their budget sheet what the damage they were doing to the environment, they were making money at the expense of the environment, which should be, again, a public good. So I mean, there's this phrase, externalities, right? If they're not accounting for it, I think environmental impact needs to become an, I guess, what's the opposite of externality, an internality? Okay. So yes, I would, I would agree. Um, yeah, I, I agree too, unfortunately. Um, I think people would be sad if they couldn't go to the beach because it was toxic, et cetera, but that doesn't or hasn't really moved, except moved people to, to action or governments and you know people that could make it happen, except in really isolated places. Like I'm thinking about DDT um, and some other you know toxic releases in California. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, that money, money talks. So when thinking about financial quantification, continuing that line of thought, uh, how important is it to get the right answer versus an answer that motivate climate actions? Okay, I'll take this one first. So, so this is something that my colleagues and I who just uh, put, we put together our CTAC proposal because one of the things we were looking at is, so when you look at the literature on ecosystem services, every group has a different way that they run the science and it's all very specific to this coastal ecosystem or this way that they quantify the services. But when we think about the need to uh, assess the financial value of nature around the world, we can't go to every ecosystem and do these detailed scientific studies. It's not possible. And so one of the things, one of the motivating factors for our, for our, our, our presentation, like when we started, we were looking, can we come up with a lowest common denominator that would apply to a lot, like is it just a habitat layer? Like can you simplify kind of to the point like how accurate versus universally applied? And that's kind of what we were thinking. Like could you, if we looked at all these EPI, the ecological production functions, and then broke them apart, could we look to see if there's one type of data? Like so we were looking to see if, if they were precise or accurate, right? So precision means you're hitting the, the, the same place every time. Accurate means you're hitting the bullseye. And so we were wondering like, are these models precise, accurate, or precise and accurate? And 
accurate's really hard, as we were just talking about, because it's really hard. And I think um, the previous speaker was talking about that we don't really know how to measure success in, in, um, in nature-based solutions. So then we were thinking, like, how precise are they? Like, if we take a bunch of different ecological production functions and we look at them together, are they all hitting about in the same place, even if we can't evaluate accuracy? And would that tell us something about what the main data type that's driving their answer? And if we find it's a habitat layer or a distance to development or, you know, there's some, then could we, could we normalize across that and use like the base layer? So you're right, it wouldn't be necessarily accurate, but if we quantified it consistently, could we then look at variable risk? And um, so I don't know the answer, but that's kind of how I've been thinking about it. Have you guys thought about that? I, I can I can I can talk about it maybe from a slightly different perspective and not necessarily just natural ecosystems, but thinking about coastal resource use and offshore wind development, for example, which is really um, you know going to be ramping up in the U.S. now. What if we can design these farm systems to not only generate energy but to enhance? their ecosystem services or, or provide ecosystem services to the environment at the same time. And so maybe think about things like co-location of offshore wind with seaweed farming or other aquaculture that brings even more species and biodiversity, perhaps protecting, conserving habitats and natural fishing grounds for other um, users of that space. And so then you know, have at least a system that may be more controlled that you can more accurately um, say this this is providing X amount of, mm -hmm. of services that's worth this. Yeah, and I guess I'll, I'll also add to um, what I think I heard Anna Michelle saying is that if, if you could measure the acreage of a habitat, like if I knew I started with 10 of ache, 10 amounts of this acre and, and you whatever I did, now I have 20. I feel like that is something that's very directly measurable. Mm -hmm. But what I will add to it is this, is that we do know very well now that um, contiguous habitat is much more valuable than small pieces of habitat. So I feel like that rule would have to be added, that it can't be I'm just going to go all over the country and put tiny little dots of wetlands around. That will actually definitely not have the same function as having larger wetlands. So I think the amount of acreage could be for first order um, for each habitat. I think that is a place to start. Yeah. As long as we are uh, make it contiguous. But the other thing I'll add to that is uh, in a lot of restoration science is realizing that there's lots of um, communication between habitats. So, so for example, um, having a, a healthy seagrass meadow actually helps you restore a salt marsh mm -hmm. because they are working together in how they manipulate the environment. And understanding those synergies would also be important in making this sort of area-based metric of what have I restored and what value should I be given for having restored it? I think that comes in with um, mitigation banking. That's been around for a while, um, you know, where there are companies who, like, like, like you were saying, Heidi, like it's more valuable to have contiguous habitat. So there are companies that maintain um, wetlands or, or, e or um, coastal ecosystems and they sell these credits. So under the National Environmental Policy Act, when you, um, if you, you have to go through a NEPA review and if you have any, if you're gonna, if your project's gonna damage an ecosystem or a coastal ecosystem like a wetland, you have to either avoid it, uh, come up with a different strategy and if you can't avoid it, you have to mitigate it. You have to do a restoration project. So these mitigation banks have been around for a long time. And, um, and they're designed to have this contiguous habitat and somebody who's doing a development project would buy a share of it so that they would pay into maintaining this habitat. And there's, um, there's new talk of doing a restoration bank. And so it, it gets a little contentious because some people say you shouldn't have a restoration bank because that gives the polluter permission to pay because they can be like, oh, it doesn't matter if I spill this chemical, I'll just go to the restoration bank and I'll buy my credits and it's cheaper to do that than to worry too much about safety. But at the same time, I think, I, I, I think that there's enough deterrence in the legal system that nobody's gonna want to spill anything and go to the restoration bank. And I think one of the interesting things that's come out of the Deepwater Horizon um, Natural Resource Damage Assessment is that they have designed, and I don't know all of the details, but they've designed really complex restoration programs that are exactly what you're talking about, are designed to flow together and to build up the ecosystems because the award, the, not award, the damages that were collected in that, 
And that case was so large that it gave, it provides an, a, an enormous reservoir of funding to create these restoration projects and to, for us to really learn scientifically what happens when you restore and how those ecosystem services work together. So Cindy, we're, uh, we're now going to start fielding some questions from the live audience. Okay, sure. So if you have a question, raise your hand and we'll come to you. Um, I just wanted to touch on kind of that last concern you were bringing up, and I think that a lot of people have these concerns about putting like this financial tag on an ecosystem service for that reason. Um, I used to be an EPA contractor myself, and I think that one concern that a lot of us, you know, noticed, um, especially with NEPA, you know, as you were saying, um, is that you've got basically these projects, these mitigation projects that can effectively, you know, sort of shift the blame from the company of uh, their own pollution actions. And they can basically say, well, look, there's this other project that I did. And oftentimes the, so the ecosystem benefits of those are, don't really line up to the, um, so the effects of the pollution from the polluting company. Um, and like my knowledge of this is sort of from PFAS and PFAS pollution in freshwater more than coastal ecosystems. But this does happen frequently, and I think Heidi was getting at this as well, where there's these negative externalities that then are not necessarily accounted for, especially, and it becomes an environmental justice issue as well, because the com communities that are often affected by those externalities are you know, typically more low income, um, typically more minority. So how do you make sure that sort of the mitigation projects or, you know, aquaculture, whatever you're doing are sort of commensurate with the um, sort of polluting activities of a company or of a government? Sorry, I guess that's like a long-winded okay, question. <laughs> so, yeah, so in, that's what we do in natural resource damage assessment. And so you're right, sometimes the restoration projects are not, so it's called in place in kind um, when we think about restoration projects and that means whatever the resource was, was injured, the most preferred restoration project is in place in kind. So it's the same services that were lost and the, the location where the services were lost. But sometimes, uh, depending on where the location was, that's actually not the most beneficial, whether to environmental justice communities or to just the ecosystem as a whole. You know, if you've got an injury in the offshore waters that, you know, dissipated very rapidly, nobody's out there, you know, say if you think you're in the middle of the Gulf of Mexico, you know, doing a project to benefit offshore animals might not be as beneficial as doing something that helps with marine mammal stranding or, you know, preventing marine mammal stranding or helping influence, you know, sustain marshes where most juvenile fish are, are, um, are you know, spawning and are being born and rearing. So um, I think there's, a, but your question made me think of something a little bit different. And that's instead of focusing on like the natural resource damage assessment where there's been an injury and you're having to restore for it, what I'm really excited about right now and what I've been working on for the last year is when I look at company sustainable development goals, you know, they've got all these goals for carbon capture and all this stuff. And offsetting is probably going to be part of our carbon neutral story for a while. And so I'm really excited about the idea of helping businesses who are looking to achieve carbon, zero, carbon neutrality or, or net zero, looking at where they're choosing to do their offsets, looking for, you know, if you're, if you're a, a power plant and you're emitting, you know, chemicals and air pollution in a historically disadvantaged community, but you're buying offsets sets in, in, you know, in native forest in Oregon or something like that, that's really not helping the, the downtown community. So can you develop offsets or, or projects that sequester carbon, but also have those co-benefits? I think Paul was talking about co-benefits in the last talk. So I think that, I think sustainable development goals and ESG goals for companies and governments is a really good place to really think more about. They may be looking to sequester carbon, but what are the co-benefits? And I think environmental justice is one of the most important ones that we can think about there. I guess I want to add a little bit something to that is that, um, if you go around the world, there's other countries that are a little less contentious around this issue than the United States. I think the Netherlands is a great example. Um, the government of the Netherlands recently 
told Shell they have got to meet their standards by, is it 2050? I can't remember. They, they held up, so they're pressuring them. Um, and uh, I also think that in, uh, uh, in there's parts of Europe where when you pull up at a gas station, you can, su you can elect spontaneously to pay more so that you are covering the carbon cost of your, um, of your gasoline. And I think, I can't imagine that in the United States. So I think, I, I would love to see the United States have a huge shift in mentality about this. And I hope that as engineers and or business people, as you go forward, every engineering school, every business school should be teaching the same as a medical school. First, do no harm. You know, anytime you're about to do anything, first think about what harm it could cause. And that includes the environment. And I think that we're not there in the United States, and I think that needs to happen. So if some of you want to go into public education, great, you have to teach the next generation because they have to learn that too. I think that we've, we've failed um, in community education about the environment, which is why the United States is so far behind on this issue. Yeah, I can add maybe just a, a quick story of um, a community in Costa Rica that, you know, they were, ha they were um, harvesting sea turtle eggs and um, to protect the sea turtles, they closed all that down and closed the beaches. And, um, and so the, the townspeople were, you know, lost a, an important source of income. But, you know, when they closed that down to protect the turtles, they didn't think about that livelihood. But in this, in this one particular town, a, a local hotel worked with the people in that town to develop new jobs that were related to tourism. So instead of actually looking and harvesting the eggs of the turtles on the beach, they would actually look for signs of when the turtles were coming in so that they could radio back to the hotel and have a, a contained group of tourists then go safely out with you know, red lights so they're not harming the turtle and making sure they're staying a certain distance away. And it, it's a really, really incredible example that is starting to um, appear at other locations. Mm -hmm. So there, I mean, there's hopefully on a bigger scale we can do something more like that. Do we have any other questions from the audience? Ooh, okay. <laughs> we'll come over here next. Oh, hi there. So this is maybe a more basic question on green infrastructure and, you know, seaweeds, mangroves and everything. Um, so, so, you know, Heidi, you said do no harm. That should be our mantra for moving forward. Is there, what's the concern or is there much concern with like, let's say I want to build a natural reef here to stop tides from storms. Like, how does that impact the like pre-existing ecosystem, the pre-existing wildlife? And is it, is that something you think about? Is it too much of a concern sometimes? And that like, you know, or can we plant seagrass everywhere and sort of just go for it kind of thing? Hmm. That's a good question. I guess I think we've, we've lost so much of our marsh and seagrass already, close to 50%, um, that I can't imagine getting to the point of that I have I'm recreating too much marsh or seagrass that I'm imposing on someone else. But I think more generally in the spirit of your question is that um, uh, do you have to think about what habitats you are potentially losing while you gain these other habitats? And I, I do think that that is true. You should have to do that. And I think that does happen when Paul was talking about the permitting. One of the biggest permitting issues they deal with is that if they want to move any earth around, especially in aquatic environments, they have to say, well, what, what's that going to do to the benthic fauna? Um, so yes, I do think that's something to consider. But I, I also think that we are so far behind in, in destroying nature that everything we can do to restore it, would, we should do. I could add one additional thing in that one concern might be that this new structure that you put out attracts invasive species, mm. for example. Mm. And so now you're providing all this new habitat for something that used to be rare in the environment and now is uh, allowed to you know, proliferate. So yeah, you, you want to avoid that. But yeah. <laughs> OK, we can take a question over here now. Sure, Brad Lupton from um, the executive program here at MIT. Uh, as corporate leaders, I'm curious how we can start to bring green, uh, sorry, blue carbon credits to the forefront of our ESG initiatives, just like green you know, historically has been. What are the challenges you see as starting to make that commonplace in the conversations? Uh, so I think that there is a lot, there are a lot of initiatives in blue carbon. There's the, called the Blue Carbon Initiative, actually, I think it is. <laughs> um, and interestingly enough, it's really being led by 
um, conservation groups like Conservation International and Nature Conservancy are very involved because they see the, the message is let's conserve and restore in order to do the blue carbon. I think the biggest obstacle is what we've already mentioned is that um, what is the verification process and how do, we, how do we promise that if you restore this much then you get this much credit and that's a, that's a fair credit because I think there's already evidence in some of the um, terrestrial credit systems that as soon as people learn the rules, they're going to try and bend the rules to their advantage. So um, I think that's going to go on in the blue carbon markets also. So we need more information. We need more funding. <laughs> <laughs> OK, we have time for one more question. And I also wanted to kind of spin off of that. Tomorrow, we're going to have a Coastal Ecosystems 2 panel. Um, part of our virtual day, and we will actually have someone from Conservation International who's worked on a blue carbon project in Colombia, and also someone from Vera, which creates um, the standards for these blue carbon crediting projects. So tune in tomorrow if this topic is of interest to you. So in the interest of time, we can take one final question from the audience. Is there any more? If not, I'll take one from the webcast. OK, I'm going to take one from the webcast then. Um, Mm. There's so many, it's hard to choose. Do you want me to do one? Yeah, Cindy, you can pick the final one. Awesome. So we talked about public education of environmental protection and also offering advice to young people who are starting, uh, looking to start a career in climate solutions. So there's one question that's about, um, sorry, there are so many, I just lost them. Uh, what training would you each require policymakers and municipalities to complete in order to learn how to respond to necessary coastal legislation? Could you say it again? What education would we? Um, what training would you require policymakers and municipalities to complete in order to learn how to respond to necessary? Coastal ecosystem legislation. I don't know. That's, that's <laughs> a very hard question. I would encourage them. I don't know that. I, I think there's. Uh, I think there's a baseline training that that they would need to have. But at the same time, I think it's important to to know what you don't know. And I think that that's one of the most important things for policymakers is to know when you don't know the answer. Um, I mean, I think I deal with it all the time. It, you know, with. Any project I take on, I'm hyper aware of what I don't know, and it scares me sometimes. But then I just know that I have to go find out the stuff that I don't know. Mm -hmm. And so I think sometimes um, in politics, there's kind of a we know everything sometimes um, mentality. So I, I just, you got to have the right people, the right scientists to help you understand what you need to be concerned about. That's my take. Well, I think you're a good example, too, of that kind of cross-cultural training that you really need to be able to talk to and engage these different groups. Because mm -hmm. they all have their own language, yes. you know, the politicians, the scientists, you know, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So at least having some training outside their discipline, mm -hmm. I think, would go a long way. Yeah, and I'm, I'm going to turn it around then. What I think all engineers and scientists should be trained in is how to explain what you do and to other people so that it actually can become part of a policy that you actually can sell why this is an important thing. So that would be the flip side of that question. That's very true. I believe that um, in our world as consultants, I believe the best consultants are the best storytellers. And not like a, a, a fictional story. You mm. just got to be able to tell your science. And I'm sure you guys know this. Yeah. Like the best talks at any scientific conference are not the ones that are super you know, detailed on the milligrams or micrograms or nanograms of this, that, and the other. The ones, the best talks you want to go hear are the ones where the, the scientist is telling a great story that makes sense. And so learn to tell stories with your research. OK, great. And with that, we will conclude the Coastal Ecosystems panel. Thank you, everyone, for an amazing discussion. We will now take a 30-minute snack break, which will be located right outside the auditorium in the Ting foyer. In order to keep everyone safe, please only have your mask off if you are actively eating, distance yourself from others, and please spread out in the foyer, lobby, and dive lounge. Let me know if you have any questions.